Good evening. Hey, Dave. How you doing up there? Would y'all give um, Dave a round of applause? He's up there every... Everybody doing okay? All right, good. Y'all glad to be here? When you look at it out there, the world situation, are you really glad to be here? I am. This, is the, this cross right here is the only place of refuge in the world. Do y'all believe that? Let's get the Lord in prayer. Dear me, Father, thank you so much for your grace and your mercy. And I thank you, Lord, that you are great. And I thank you, Lord, that you, you love each man in this room. And I thank you, dear God, that you want to, to have each man in this room know you in a personal way. That's why you created each one of us. You know us by name. Your word tells us that you have the, even the hairs on our head numbered, which I know is easy in my case these days. But Lord, I just thank you that you do know us and that you love us. I thank you, Lord, for giving us your word, the Bible, which will stand for all time. And all we have to do is read it, and you will speak to us, and we can come to know you through it. And not only that, as we trust you, your spirit will indwell us and will whisper to our hearts that we belong to you so that each man can know when he wakes up in the morning that he is a child of the King, that God, that you're their Heavenly Father, and that one day you're coming back for those who belong to you. And therefore, we have nothing to fear in this world. So, Lord, I thank you for these truths. I thank you for these promises. And, Lord, I, I thank you even for the, um, the difficult times that we go through, because that's what I want to talk about tonight, is that sometimes you bring the rain. Sometimes you bring the storms into our lives, and they're always guided by your, by your hand. Nothing is outside of your control, particularly for those who belong to you. You're orchestrating the events of our lives, and you're in control of our lives. And so we can rest in the, the assurance that our steps are ordered by you. So Lord, I pray that for those t men tonight who are here, who still don't yet know you, that they would be drawn to you tonight and come to you by faith so that they can know that, that you're going to order the steps of their lives and that you're going to bring them to the end of their lives safe and secure in you. And then they can pass through death's door into heaven. So that's what I pray for tonight, Lord. I pray that your word will now go forth and accomplish the very purpose for which you intend. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. All right. Um, we're in Genesis chapter 28. I've entitled this message, God's Refinery. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 2, we read, For God will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. It says that God will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. Now, this particular verse puzzled some women in a Bible study, and they wondered what this statement meant about the character and nature of God. And so one of the women offered to find out the process of refining silver and report back to the group at the, the following, you know, the next week at their Bible study. So that week the woman called a silversmith and made an appointment to go and observe him at work. And she didn't mention to, to this silversmith anything about the reason for her interest in being there other than that she just wanted to learn the process of refining silver. And she watched the silversmith he took a piece of silver and he held it out over the fire where the flame was the hottest, the hottest to heat it up. And he explained that in refining silver, you need to hold the silver in the middle of the fire where the flames are the hottest in order to burn out all the impurities. And when the woman heard that, she thought about God holding us in such a hot spot. And then she thought again about the verse that says, He sits as a refiner and purifier of silver. And so she asked the silversmith if it was true that he had to sit there in front of the fire and, and watch the whole time that the silver was being refined. And, and the man answered that yes, he not only had to sit there holding the silver, but he had to keep his eyes on the silver the entire time it was in the fire. If the silver was held there any longer than, than necessary, it would destroy the silver. And then the woman she was silent and she thought for a moment and she asked the silversmith, 
How do you know when the silver is full or refined? To which the silversmith smiled and responded, oh, that's easy, when I see my image in it. So I mean, let me ask you something. Are you going through the fire right now? Has God got you in a hot place? Well, I want you to know this. If God's got you in a hot place, He's got you there for a purpose. And He's got His eyes upon you. And He will not let you be there longer than is necessary. But He's got you there for a reason. Last week I shared with you that the Christian life is a difficult journey. And when you enter this journey known as the Christian life, you need to understand that you're really entering into God's refinery. Webster defines a refinery as a plant that is used for purifying material so that they become more perfect and more useful. You see, God wants to use us. He created each one of us with a purpose. He's got a plan for your life. And He wants to use you. But listen, before that He can use you, He has to do a work in your heart. He's had to do a work in my heart. And often that work is not very much fun because it can be painful. In the margin of my Bible, this Bible right here that I've had with me a long time, you know, this Bible has been with me all around the world. Wherever I've been, I take this Bible with me. And if I lose it, I'm going to go buy a gun. But I'm not going to lose it. <laughs> But anyway, in, in my Bible, besides 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 20 and 21, I have this date written, August the 6th, 1999. August the 6th, 1999. Now, that date was about one month before I entered seminary. I entered seminary in 1999 in, the, in September when I was 45 years old. It seemed like a long time ago, but it's amazing how, how quickly time passes. Well, anyway, Paul writes in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 20 and 21. He says, um, in a large house. Now, what does he mean by a large house? He's talking about the house, think of it as your heart or, or your life. And there's some things in there, some things that are good, some things that are not good. So he says, in a large house, there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for noble purposes and some for ignoble. Now, catch this. If a man cleanses himself from the latter, he will be an instrument for noble purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. Now, why did I put August the 6th, 1999 in my Bible? Well, it was about, a, as I said, one month before I entered seminary. And I, I, obviously I was reading it on August the 6th of that year. And as I read that, I was convicted that there was some things still in my heart that God had to deal with. Some, some sin in my heart. And I knew what it was. And God knew what it was. And basically he was saying to me, Russ, I know you're getting ready to go to seminary. If you want me to use you, then you've got to let me clean you up. Because you've got some things in your life that I don't want in your life. And so, if a man, if you want, listen, if you want to be used by God, do you want to be used by God? Do you understand there's no greater privilege than to be used by God? Because one day you'll stand before Him, and if you've allowed Him to use you, then He'll say two words to you, what would they be? Well done. Would you like to step into heaven and hear God say, Well done, Steve. Well done, David. Got two Steves right here. Would you like to hear those words? Well done. If you want to hear those words one day, then you have to in your heart say, Lord, I want to be used by you. Do with me what you will. If a man cleanses himself from the latter, he'll be an instrument for noble purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. See, being in God's refinery, though sometimes painful, it's actually a very good place to be because it's in his refinery that he does the, the greatest work in a man's heart. And that's where Jacob needed to be. Jacob was too dependent on his mother. He was selfish and he'd, used, he'd learned to use deception to get what he wanted. And that's not the way God does things. God does not like us to be deceptive. And so God needed to bring Jacob into his refinery so that he could purge some things from his heart. And that's what we're going to see in chapters 29 and 30 and 31. God is going to bring Jacob into his refinery and he's going to work on his heart. In Psalm chapter 51 verse 10, David cries out, he says to God, Create in me a pure heart, O God. Is it, let me ask you this. Is that the cry of your heart? Would you like for God to create a pure heart within you? Well, if the answer to that is yes then you have to be willing to surrender to God and enter into His refinery. 
tonight. What I want to do is, um, and I'm taking this from Pastor Stephen Cole. Pastor Cole is somebody that I've discovered online, and I'll, sometimes I'll read his sermons and see, you know, this, there are plenty of people that have taught Genesis 29 before me. And so I don't have all the best ideas in the world. So sometimes I'll go steal somebody's idea, and they call that plagiarism, unless you give them credit for it. So I'm giving Pastor Stephen Cole credit for this idea. And here's the idea that he had when he looked at Genesis 29, and that is this. He would, Stephen Cole told his congregation, and it's what I want to teach you guys tonight, that God will use circumstances, He will use consequences, He will use difficult people over the course of time to refine us men so that we will become men of godly character so that He can use us. And tonight, in Genesis 28, we, we, we learned that last week that God appeared to Jacob and He told Jacob that He was going to bless him and that He was going to fulfill those covenant promises that He made to Abraham through him. And so in, in chapter 29, verse 1, it literally can be translated that Jacob lifted up his feet and that he headed east. So Jacob discovered a new skip in his step. He had a new bounce in, in his life. And, and why is that? Well, it's because he knew that God was going to be with him. And Jacob didn't have to worry about Esau anymore. And so life was good. Things were looking up. But what Jacob didn't realize is that God was actually bringing him into his refinery so that he could refine Jacob and make him into a man that he could use. And so God, we're going to see tonight and in the next two weeks that God is going to, over the course of 20 years, he's going to do a mighty work in Jacob's heart. And so I want you to see how this story unfolds. And I, in the process, I want to show you how God will use the circumstances in your life to transform you men into men that He can use. Are you ready? Pastor Stephen Cole, in his sermon on this chapter, states, Note the fortunate circumstances which Jacob encounters on his trip. He happens upon a well where there happens to be some shepherds who happen to be from Haran and happen to know Laban. And just as Jacob is talking to them, Rachel happens to come along. What luck? Was it really luck? Absolutely not. In your outline, Jacob was being guided by the providential hand of God right into his refinery. Now, how do we know that God was guiding Jacob? How do we know that God ordered these circumstances in his life? Well, I want to give you two reasons that we know this to be true. First, we know that the circumstances of Jacob's life were ordered by God because that's what the Bible teaches. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9 states, In his heart a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. In Isaiah chapter 14, verse 24, it says, The Lord Almighty has sworn, has sworn, Surely as I plan, so it will be. And as I purpose, so it will stand. Isaiah 46, verse 11 states, From the east I summon a bird of prey. Now this is God speaking. He says, From a far land I summon a man to fulfill my purpose. What I've said, that will I bring about. And what I've planned, that will I do. And finally, Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. Do y'all get the picture? Who's in control? And if you, reckon, if you see that God's in control, should you worry? <laughs> really. So why do we worry? You see, all throughout the Bible, you can see the hand of God bringing events and people in line with the sovereign will. God chose Abraham to be the father of a nation. Thus, he ordered his steps, of, of the steps of his life, to bring him to an unknown land. God chose Joseph and raised him to the throne of Egypt. And thus he ordered the steps of his life to bring him to power. God chose Moses to lead a nation out of slavery. And thus he ordered the steps of his life to bring him to the promised land. God chose David to be the king over a nation. Thus he ordered the steps of his life to bring him to the throne. And God chose his son to die for the sins of the world. And thus he ordered the steps of Jesus to bring him to the cross. In fact, Acts chapter 2 verse 23 states... This man, now um, Luke is writing about Jesus. He says, This man was handed over to you, the Pharisees, by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. I want you all to really understand this. God is in control. That's why when I pick up the paper, I'm not saying I don't ever worry. I do, unfortunately. But when I look at the paper and I read about all the things that are happening, I don't lose a whole lot of sleep over it. 
Like I've never worried about global warming. Are y'all worried about global warming? I mean, give me a break. God's, who controls the thermostat? Thank you. God does. You see, Jacob was chosen by God to be the father of the twelve tribes of Israel. And thus God ordered the steps of his life to bring this about. That's why he's bringing him up to Haran. He's going to meet somebody. You see, when you choose to follow Christ, men, you and, and, and I, we should rest in the assurance that our steps are ordered by God. And we know this to be true. Why? Because that's what the Bible says. Secondly, we know that the circumstances of Jacob's life were ordered by God because in Genesis chapter 28, verse 15, God said to Jacob, I am with you and I will watch over you wherever you go. So Jacob comes to the well and he sees several shepherds lying around doing nothing. And he asked them where they were from. And they responded, we're from Haran. And then Jacob asked them, do you know Laban? And they said, yes, we do know him. And then, then Jacob asked them if he's well. And they said, yes, he is. And here comes his daughter Rachel with the sheep. Now I believe at the very moment Jacob heard the news that Laban's daughter was coming, I think in his heart he knew that she was the one. Remember what Isaac, his father, told him just before he left? He said, don't marry a Canaanite. I want you to go and marry one of Laban's daughters. And so here she comes. And I believe it was love at first sight. Has that ever happened to any of you? That's what happened to my wife when she saw me. Uh-huh. That's another... I'm thankful she's not here to respond to that. You know, so... I have had a, a cameraman one time wanting to have a picture of, he said, if he's looking at me, I want to have a picture of you and your daughter. And I, it was my wife. I'm going, what, what's the deal here, buddy? All right, look at verses 9 through 12. Y'all with me? Verse 9. It says, while he was still talking with them, that is Jacob, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. When Jacob saw Rachel, daughter of Laban, and Laban's sheep, he went over and rolled the stone away from the mouth of the well and watered his uncle's sheep. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and began to weep aloud. He told Rachel that he was a relative of her father and a son of Rebekah, so she ran and told her father. Now, I believe at this moment right here that Jacob thinks he is in control of the circumstances of his life. I think he's still trying to work them out for his own advantage. And what he didn't realize is that God was the one who was superintending the whole process, and God was going to use these circumstances to change Jacob for the better so that he can actually use him. And so, man, as believers, it should give us a great sense of comfort to know that God is in, the, is in control of the circumstances of our lives. Then we don't have to worry. This is why Tozer said, A.W. Tozer, to the child of God, there's no such thing as an accident. He travels an appointed way. Accidents may indeed appear to befall him and misfortune stalk his way, but these evils will be so in appearance only and will seem evils only because we cannot read the secret script of God's hidden providence and so cannot discover the ends at which he aims. The man of true faith may rest in the absolute assurance that his steps are ordered by God. Do, do you all believe that about your life if you're in Christ? And if you're not in Christ then you're ordering your own steps. And you think about that. That's a very dangerous place to be. There's no more secure place in the world than to be in Christ and know that God is ordering the steps of your life. And listen, when you mess up, He'll pick you up and He'll make your path straight. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in Him. Lean not on your own understanding. And all your ways acknowledge Him and He'll make your path what? Straight. God had a plan for Jacob's life. He was going to bring the Savior of the world from his very seed. And therefore, God had to orchestrate the circumstances of life to bring him to Rachel and Leah. And in the process, he was going to transform the heart of this man. And so, men, if you're in Christ, then you need to trust God with the circumstances of your life and know that he will use them to refine you so that you become the man that he wants you to be so that he can use you. And so let me ask you, are you trusting God with the circumstances of your life? Are you? Not only will God use the circumstance of your life, but God will also use the consequences of your sin to refine you 
into a man of godly character. See, he doesn't even waste your sin. Things were going well for Jacob for the first month. He was in love. He had a roof over his head. He had long stopped worrying about Esau. His past was behind him. Everything looked good. And so it must have appeared to him that his past sins had been overlooked. It looked like, well, mother's scheme certainly worked. I've been blessed by God. I'm safely here in Iran. I'm on my way to securing a wife. And God has forgiven me. Everything's okay. But man, I want you to understand this truth. God never lets us sin and walk away without consequences. Did you know that? If we're in Christ, our sins have been forgiven. But we still have to deal with the consequences. David committed both adultery and murder in his affair with Bathsheba. And do you know what Nathan prophesied over him? He said, the sword will never depart from your house. Did you all hear that? Nathan told David, he said, the sword will never depart from your house. Do you know what happened to David? One son, Amnon, raped one of his sisters, Tamar, who was David's daughter. So you've got one of David's sons, Amnon, who raped one of David's daughters. You get that brother raping sister. And so another brother by the name of Absalom murdered Amnon. And then Absalom sought revenge. Excuse me, later Absalom tried to overthrow his father's kingdom. In the process, he took some of his father's wives, ten concubines to be specific, and he lay with them in public, just as Nathan had prophesied. And eventually, Absalom was killed when Joab, David's general, thrust three javelins into his heart. And the son that was born to David and Bathsheba died. And so the sword never departed from David's house. But did you know this? God loved David. Do you know why God loved David? Because David had a heart for God. In Acts chapter 13, verse 22, we read, After removing Saul, God made David their king. And God testified concerning him. This is what God said about David. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. Can you imagine if God said that about you? He's a man after my own heart. And yet David committed murder, adultery, he lied, he coveted. See, we're all sinners. But do you know what God loved about David? When Nathan came and confronted him, he didn't make up any excuses. He, I'm sure he bowed his head and he said, I've sinned before God. In Psalm chapter 51, verses 16 and 17, David writes, and he's talking to God. He says, God, you do not delight in sacrifice, I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. And what he means by that is, God, you don't delight in any religious activities that I go through. You're not really concerned in, about my religious strivings. Aren't y'all glad to know that? It's not religion that gets us into heaven. What's he looking for? He's looking at our hearts. And what David says next, he says, the sacrifice of God that he's looking for are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. See, man, what God wants to see in you and me, he wants to see us with broken and contrite hearts. And so have you ever really looked in the mirror and really acknowledged the fact that you are a sinner who needs to be saved? Have you? See, it doesn't come naturally because what we want to do is we want to defend ourselves. Well, God, I did that because of so-and-so. It wasn't really my fault. Yeah, it was your fault. What God wants to see in us is humility. And once we've passed through God's refinery, we will come out with humble hearts if we submit to God's discipline. And we will, we will only be useful to the Master if we humble ourselves before Him just like David. Now back to the text. You know what happens here. Laban is going to deceive Jacob. Jacob has met his match. And so uh, Laban comes to him and says, you know, um, you don't need to be working for me for free, even though you're relative, I'm going to pay you. What would you like? And so he says, you know, you work for me for seven years and I'll give you Rachel. And Jacob agrees to that. In verse 19, Laban said, it's better that I give her to you than to some other man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years to get Rachel, but they seemed like only a few days to him because of his love for her. And you know what happens. Laban probably threw a, a great big party. It's a great time of celebration. Love was in the air. And I'm sure there's plenty of champagne flowing. 
At the end of the evening, Laban took his daughter Leah and gave her to Jacob, and Jacob lay with her. Now, I know what everybody's thinking. How in the heck could he not have known that she wasn't Rachel? Have you tried to figure that one out? Well, I think, you know, uh, remember Laban is, Re is um, Rebecca's brother. And what was Rebecca good at? Deception. See, it runs in the family. And you think about what, Re you think about what Rebecca did. She made uh, Jacob look like Esau, and she made him smell like Esau. And that's exactly what Laban did with Leah. He made her look like Rachel. He put on her veil, her wedding dress, and he gave her some perfume. So when she went into that bedroom that night, it was dark. Jacob probably had a little too much to drink. They probably weren't talking a whole lot. <laughs> you don't talk a whole lot on the first night of your honeymoon, man. And then the next morning, <clears throat> uh, he turned over and pulled back the cover. He thought he was going to pile there because he heard her three words, surprise, surprise, surprise. <laughs> and he got a big surprise. Look at verses 25 through 26. When, when morning came, there was Leah. So Jacob said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? I served you, for, I served you for Rachel, didn't I? Why have you deceived me? And Laban replied, It is not our custom here to give the younger daughter in marriage before the older one. And so Jacob, the deceiver, was the one who in the end was deceived. The Bible declares that you reap what you sow. And Jacob now found himself in God's refinery, and God was going to use a very difficult man by the name of Laban to, to transform Jacob into a godly man. But it was going to take time. I mean, God's work is not accomplished overnight. Essentially, it's a lifetime process. But I want you to know this. What God begins, He always finishes. He never leaves His work undone. Paul writes in Philippians 1.6, being confident of this, that He who began a good work will be what? Faithful to complete it. Isn't that good news? <laughs> See, if, if you're in Christ, He's not finished with you. God's work always takes time. Look at verses 27 through 29. Laban, Laban said to Jacob, Finish this daughter's bridal week, then we will give you the younger one also in return for another seven years of work. And Jacob did so. He finished the, the, the week with Leah. And then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel to be his wife. Laban gave his servant girl Bella to his daughter Rachel as her maidservant. Jacob lay with Rachel also and he loved Rachel more than Leah and he worked for Laban another seven years. Men, God's work on us takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. In fact, it's a lifelong process. He began with me when I was 10. I'm now 60 and I sometimes wonder <laughs> God must be, warned, must be thinking, it sure has taken a long time with you, Russ. But I want you to understand this. For God to, to work on our hearts, He often has to bring us into the fire. He allows things into our lives that are difficult. I know that some of you guys are struggling with some very difficult things. We've got some men in here who are battling cancer. I've got one of my best friends who's battling cancer. We've got one of my group leaders, Doug Bogey, who's you know, just had 33 radiation treatments on his throat and he's battling blisters all up and down his throat and he's a godly man. And he's in God's refinery. But listen, when God brings you into his refinery, it's because he, he loves you. Listen to what the writer of Hebrews says in, in Hebrews chapter 12. He said, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you're not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we've all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good that we may share in His holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Twenty-one years ago, I had a friend of mine who, um, who was a fairly new believer. Bob Jenkins, and he um, came down with leukemia. And 
God refined him through that. And one night we went to an FCA banquet where Dave Dravecki was speaking. Do you all know who Dave Dravecki is? He was the, um, I think, all-star pitcher for the San Francisco Giants who developed a tumor in his deltoid muscle over here. And they ended up having to amputate him. They call it quartering. They had to come all the way over here and amputate him down through here like this. And he, he's, I've, I've met him in person. I heard him this night with my friend Bob at this banquet. And um, Dave said, you know, that he felt like half a man when he woke up the next day and saw what was left of his body. But he had become a believer one year in spring training camp down in Texas because his roommate was a Christian. And, and that roommate led him to Christ. And his life verses became 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 and 8 through 18. And this is what those three verses say. And I love these three verses. Paul writes, Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So what do we do with our eyes? We fix our eyes on what is un we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Why is that? Because what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. We have another one of our group leaders here by the name of Kyle Tucker. Kyle, where are you? Okay. Kyle, I'm going to embarrass you, but would you stand up just for a second? I know you don't. Just stand up. Okay, that's Kyle. You can sit down, Kyle. <laughs> now, Kyle grew up in a very godly home. His father, Leon, is my pastor. And, and so Kyle was pretty much a Christian from the moment he was born. I know that's not totally true, but he was, he's been following and walking with the Lord since he was basically born, five years of age probably when he accepted Christ. How old are you now, Kyle? 33. So last December, and he went to state, played golf, played golf on the state team over there. Good athlete, great looking guy, wonderful wife, three children. Last December, something's not right with his body. He goes to the hospital and discovers he's got MS, multiple sclerosis. And so I asked Kyle, I, sent him, I called him um, Saturday when he was going to the state football game. I said, Kyle, would you mind just sending him an email and telling me what, you've, what God has been teaching you through this? This is what Kyle sent me. He said, first, I've learned greater dependence on the Lord. I've realized how dependent I am on Him, whether I acknowledge it or not. But learning how to depend on Him every day has given me strength, no matter how I'm feeling. Second, I have learned the power of prayer. I used to feel like God was going to do whatever He wanted to do, no matter whether I prayed or not. But I've now come to see that God does, does actually act on our prayers. And the Bible confirms this. Third, God has been killing the pride in me. It's hard to be prideful when I realize everything that I am and everything I have comes from God. Fourth, God has made me more mindful of the needs of others. My struggles have given me a tenderness that makes me more aware of others' needs. And I have a growing desire to help and be an encouragement. And finally, God has been giving me more of an eternal mindset and a longing for heaven. I have a better realization that this life is just a vapor. And I need to be focusing my time and resources on things that will last forever rather than being consumed by the pleasures of this life. The Apostle Paul apparently had some affliction. We don't know what it was. It may have been poor eyesight. It may have been some physical illness. We don't know what it was. But three times it says in Corinthians that he pleaded with God to take it away. And I know Kyle's been pleading with God to take this away. I'm pleading for Kyle that God will take it away. That's what we should do. But this is what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 12, Kyle. I know you're familiar with this. He says, God said to, to, um, to Paul, my grace, Paul, is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. That is why, for Christ's sake, Paul says, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in persecutions, in hardships, in difficulties. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Do you know what happens when you're weak? What happens to you when you're weak? You, you lean on God. If you don't know God, it's a better chance that you might come to God. If you know God, you lean on Him more. And there's no stronger man in the world than a man who's on his knees leaning on God. And that's where he wants each one of us. He wants us to trust him. He wants us to lean on him. 
And He will use these difficult trials to make us the men that He wants us to be. And it's all because He loves us. Do you believe that? That's what the Bible teaches. That's what I believe. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You so much for Your Word. I thank You, dear God, that... Um, we thank you, Lord, for the trials. I have to be honest, I don't want any trials. I want pleasure and joy and happiness and peace. But, Lord, I know that I live in a difficult world. And you tell, tell us in John 16, 33, that in this world we will have trouble. But you also tell us not to lose heart because you have overcome the world. It doesn't matter what's going on in the world, whether it's an Ebola virus, whether it's terrorism, whether it's an earthquake, whether it's a financial collapse, whether it's cancer. You have overcome death. And if we just place our trust in you, then we can know that when we pass through death's door, we will enter heaven. And I believe that with all my heart. And I want every man in this room, Lord, to know that. So I pray, Lord, that you would continue to work on our hearts and draw us to yourself. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Amen. See you guys next Tuesday.